I have some bad news. You, and pretty much everybody else you know, have something called shifting baseline syndrome. It's not your fault. The symptoms are easy to miss. In fact, most people don't even realize they have it. But the consequences of shifting baseline syndrome can be devastating for the planet. Oh, sorry, I should probably clarify. This isn't a medical condition. I'm, uh, I'm not that kind of a doctor. Shifting baseline syndrome, or SBS, is actually a social and psychological phenomenon that can affect how we see and interact with nature. In ecology, shifting baseline syndrome is defined as a gradual change in the accepted baseline condition of the environment due to a lack of human experience, memory, or knowledge of its past condition. Put more simply, SBS occurs when the natural environment degrades over time, but people don't notice because they don't know or remember what the environment used to look like. You see, each generation grows up getting used to the way that their environment looks and feels. They accept the environmental situation into which they were born as the normal, natural environment. But as time goes on and the environment becomes degraded or more polluted, the next generation thinks that this is normal because this is what they were born into. In other words, the habitats that your grandparents probably think of as degraded, your children will probably think of as perfectly normal. The modern definition for shifting baseline syndrome was first described in 1995 by Dr. Daniel Pauly, a world-renowned expert in marine fisheries. Pauly noticed that fishers and scientists tended to think that the number of fish in the ocean at the beginning of their careers was the normal, healthy, baseline population size for a species. As time went on, they would judge any changes in fish population size against what they saw when they first started their careers. The problem with this is the baseline they were using probably wasn't correct. The species they were studying may have been far more abundant several centuries ago, but that species may have since experienced a pretty substantial population decline. The current generation of fishers and scientists incorrectly assume that the present population size is the normal population size because they've never seen anything any different. This means that with each new generation of scientists and fishers, a new bar for normal is set. Because of this, we may not even realize that a population is declining. For example, researchers have found that older, more experienced fishers in eastern Indonesia are better able to notice declines in fish populations than younger, less experienced fishers. Of course, shifting baseline syndrome doesn't just apply to fish. Humans have this problem in virtually every ecosystem on the planet. In England, scientists found that younger residents were less able to notice changes in the abundance of bird species than older residents. In Bolivia, younger generations notice less change in the number of tree and fish species than older generations. In Alaska, surveys found that younger people were less aware of changes in local water quality and availability. Or how about this? Most of us tend to think of national parks as really pristine, but when you think about it, there are roads, campgrounds, and usually other types of human development in what we think of as normal, natural, healthy habitat. And of course, our acceptance of more extreme weather is another good example of SBS. Younger generations are becoming a lot more accustomed to extreme heat waves, fires, hurricanes, and floods. And these are events that older generations would probably have considered a lot more rare. Ultimately, the problem is, without any memory, knowledge, or experience of what the environment used to look like, it becomes increasingly difficult for us to recognize when something has changed. This is what makes SBS so scary. As Dr. Polly once said, we are transforming the world, but we don't remember it. So why is SBS such a big problem? Well, for starters, if we accept unhealthy and degraded environments as normal, we can become complacent about how the environment is really changing and fail to take action. We get used to degraded wilderness, less diversity, and higher levels of pollution. We become satisfied with environments that are in terrible condition, including our own cities and towns, and we don't do anything to fix it. After all, how can I, as an ecologist, convince you that the environment is degraded if you have no memory or knowledge of it being any different. How do I make people think conservation is important if they literally cannot see the change? This can trap us in a horrible feedback loop where the environment gets worse, but nobody notices, so nobody fixes it. So the environment gets worse, but nobody notices, so nobody fixes it. So the environment gets worse, but nobody notices, so nobody fixes it fixes it, and then the environment gets worse, and then nobody notices it, so nobody fixes it, so then it gets worse, but nobody notices and nobody fixes it until it's gone. SBS can also have a big impact on how scientists decide which habitats and species are healthy, 
and which are not. This is because we are using the wrong baselines to make those decisions. This can lead to inaccurate conclusions about the real state of nature. It can also mean that when scientists try to design habitat restoration projects where we try to fix the damage done by people, we literally don't know what those environments are supposed to look like. As a result, we won't set the right targets or expectations for our conservation projects. Now, I realize that all of this sounds pretty bad, but there is a lot that we can do to fight shifting baseline syndrome. Yes, my friends, there is a cure. And the best part is everyone can help, no matter who you are. One of the biggest causes of SBS is when scientists don't have any long-term data to help them understand what an environment used to look like. Detailed scientific records are a relatively new thing. So in many cases, we just don't have any information on what a pristine version of a habitat might have looked like. But one way to create these records is to get creative and use alternative sources of information. Sources of information can include art and literature, memoirs, photos, and oral histories. These types of information were often considered unscientific, so they usually didn't get included when scientists were conducting investigations into past environmental conditions. Fortunately, this is starting to change, and these types of information, the type you might have stored in your attic somewhere or just locked in your memory, is being used to help scientists piece together the past. Scientists are also creating models that reconstruct the past using all sorts of different types of information, including genetics, biochemistry, and archaeology. These models can help us visualize and understand how the world has changed over centuries of human impact. Another great way to improve scientific records is to harness the power of citizen science. Citizen science is when members of the public help collect or analyze data from the natural world. Some citizen science projects can be very hands-on, where you collect samples of the environment and send them to a scientist. But many citizen science projects use apps, where people can take photos of the wildlife they see in their neighborhoods. These images get uploaded to a database and scientists can use them to try and work out what types of species live where. There are probably quite a few opportunities to get involved in citizen science where you live, so hop online and explore what might be available around you. Getting involved in citizen science can also help us deal with another major cause of SBS which is our disconnection or lack of interaction with nature. Our exposure to nature is definitely on the decline. We spend a lot more time indoors. And that means that we're probably a lot less familiar and knowledgeable with our local environment than past generations. The good news is just the simple act of going outside and interacting with nature, creating some memories and experiences in nature, can go a really long way to changing our perspectives on what a healthy environment really looks like. It can also help if we create conservation areas that are closer to human populations because this can make it easier for people to access those areas and see what environments are supposed to look like. And while I know I just said we need to go outside more, books, films, and maybe even virtual reality simulations can help us form a stronger connection to nature. These technologies can help us see what a real healthy environment looks like even if we never get to go there in person. We can then use those images and knowledge to make comparisons to our local environment. But but do get outside, that's still really important. Ultimately, while SBS can have a really negative impact on science, on the environment, and our own well-being, there is a lot that we can do to fight back. It is within our control, so let's get started. Okay, everybody, that is it for me this time. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know in the comments below, what do you think we can do to help fight SBS? Also, let me know if there's any other cool ecological topics you wanna learn about. In the meantime, I have a growing collection collection of videos on different ecological topics, including some of the biggest environmental problems we are facing. So you can go check those out whenever you like. I hope you enjoy them and I'll see you next time.